Hello everyone, this is Kaveh from Honolulu. Welcome to lesson number 10. 10 lessons already, wow. And our common Lisp series. Uh, today we're going to talk about renderers part 2. Before I do that, um, I want to talk about a little bit about some more common Lisp philosophy. And um, I wanted to mention something interesting that I encountered a while back about the idea of rapid iteration. I was watching a talk by Alan Kay if you don't know who Alan Kay is, you should Google him and watch some of his talks. They're very fascinating. Um, and he, gave, he talked about the story about human-powered flight and how basically, you know, there had been this prize called the Kramer Prize of quite a bit of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars, for anybody who could basically invent an airplane that can be flown and fly by just human power. And people would, you know, try to... Um, build airplanes and they'd crash and they'd have to rebuild them again and so on and so forth. Until this engineer came along called Paul McCready and basically he took a different tack and he said let's instead of building a full-fledged airplane let's build something that we can basically crash 10 times a day and just put it back together. So something very light and simple and straightforward. And within six weeks, they had sort of done more iterations and tests and experiments and crashes and rebuildings than anybody else had done over the, over the years. And six months later, they basically won the prize. And, you know, then they, they uh, if you look him, him up as well, you'll see, you know, the contraption that's basically like a bicycle with wings that flies and so on. It's very different from what other people have been trying to do. But the part that I found most interesting was the idea that he built his workflow around rapid iteration and around the concept of being able, you know, because if I'm assuming the other guys, other teams that were working on this project for decades, they would build these airplanes and once an airplane crashed, it would take weeks to repair it and rebuild it and be able to do the next test. But McCready was able to literally crash his airplane 10 times a day and then just rebuild it and do way more iterations and way more testing and gain way more knowledge and explore faster than any of the other teams could. So for me, that's a takeaway, and I you know, see the analogy that uh, Alan Kay was trying to make with rapid iteration and software development. It's the same way, and um, I have not found any development system that is faster than Common Lisp in terms of letting you do what you want to do and see the results immediately by you know compiling and tossing a new function definition into your live image or a new class definition to your live image. So just a little bit of an aside, and um, let's proceed now with our renderers implementation part two, in which we're going to implement a particular renderer. So first we define a couple of uh, helper functions. This function returns um, the 2D angle between two vectors, basically, and um, I'm not going to get into the math of it. This function determines if a point is in a polygon. So you give it a point P and then a list of points. And if the point is inside the circumference, inside the polygon formed by points, it returns true, otherwise it returns false. I'm not gonna get much into the math of this one either. Um, but as we'll find out later, this probably needs to be reworked because it does get quite slow quite quickly, probably because of this stuff here. Um, where I have the loops and I'm appending points um, and it's probably consing a lot and then this thing has two loops which probably there's a faster logic I just wrote these for brevity's sake and then we have another little help, help, helper function which basically just returns a copy of a point so um, one of the things we're going to be able to need to do is to find out what the bounds are of a list of points. So this basically just loops through all the points and stores the high and low bounds and returns them. And this is doing a multiple value return. So in uh, common list, functions can return more than one value. And then multiple value bind is used to destructure those returned values. And so it's another fun feature that we have. So having these um, helper functions, we can now actually make our renderer. And we're going to, this is going to be a painterly renderer, a very rough approximation of what a 
penter what a renderer with brush strokes might be like. So we have a brush jitter, which is basically the displacement off of a regular grid, a brush density, how many br how many strokes to put in there, a brush size, how big each stroke is, a brush smoothness, which is basically how round and smooth each stroke is and a brush color variation, which is basically how, what's the difference in color values between the brushes. And for our particular purposes, our brushes are always going to, just going to be a circle. So the brush smoothness is simply going to be the number of points on the circle. Um, you know, obviously, if you're going to do a proper painterly renderer which simulates brush strokes, you want to have different shapes and sizes of brush strokes and generate them algorithmically and what have you. So one of the first things we want to do is basically, given the bounds, we want to create a grid of um, brushes inside that bound. So basically, it's just returning a list of points, which is kind of like our make grid, make point grid, or whatever that thing was called that we did before. But this is uh, using the parameters from our painterly renderer, such as the brush density and uh, the jitter and so forth. So this basically returns a list of points that are going to be the locations for our brush strokes. So this is our draw with renderer method for the renderer pipeline, which takes a polygon shape and a painterly renderer. And one thing we notice is it doesn't do any actual OpenGL drawings at all, OpenGL calls at all. So it basically draws a whole bunch of brush strokes, i.e. in our case circles, here inside the polygon, and then draws the outline of the polygon afterwards. So it starts with multiple value bind, which is basically the way of destructuring multiple value return. So we know that parts, points, bounds that we defined above returns a low bound and a high bound points. So multiple value bound, multiple value bind binds them to bounds low and bounds high. And then our brush shape is just going to be a circle with appropriate smoothness and appropriate size based on the renderer. And then we make the brush grid so that essentially takes the bounds that we got from our um, points bounds function here and creates a grid of brushes in there. And we set the outline alpha to be zero because we don't want to see outlines on our brush strokes, we just want a solid color. And then for every point in the grid, we create a new color, which is a jittered color. So the, so the brushes can have some random variation in colors. And then we set that color here to be the fill part of the color. And if that point is inside the polygon, then we draw the brush. So we're actually calling the regular pipelines draw function for the brushes, which are circles. So essentially our renderer is drawing a lot of circles based on the geometry that we give it. So let's see what this looks like. So here is a pentagon shape with our regular no renderer. And we are going to create a painterly renderer, set it to assign it to the scene, brush density of one, no jitter, and no color variation. So this is the fundamental version of our painterly brush, painterly renderer. So each of these circles is a brush stroke. I have to use your imagination for now because we're just we, all our parameters are set to zero values. But so it creates a grid that goes out to the bounds of our pentagon. And then if the point of the grid is inside the pentagon, it draws a stroke, otherwise it doesn't. So that's how it kind of conforms to the shape or approximate shape of our shape. Now, if we make the brush size be smaller, for example, we get a better approximation of our shape. And then if we start varying the colors by say 0.1, so this takes the color from the appearance of the shape itself. And for now, it's just doing the exact same color. That's why it's just perfect blue. 
But if we modify the color ver colors a little bit, you can see that you're getting some slight variation in color between slightly darker, slightly lighter colors as we go along. And now we can set the jitter to be a non-zero value. So you can see the brush strokes are moving around. And there's, you know, getting a little bit of a more random feel. They're random in position now, and they're random in size. So if we increase the density and decrease the smoothness a little bit, because we have very small brushes now, we don't really need 16 or 32 points. So you can see now that this, uh, this is our first painterly look. And what we'll do is we'll turn off the alpha of the outline of our shape. We don't really want to see that anymore. So this is sort of our painterly uh, pentagon, just using a large number of jittered and varied colored um, circles. And obviously, if we go back to our regular no renderer, if all OpenGL drawing, that's what we get. Now, we'll try this with a series of nested shapes. So we're going to basically go back to here, which is one of the things we used before, which was our nested, nested uh, hexagons and uh, randomly assigned colors. And now we'll run through the same thing here. So let's start by assigning our renderer to the scene. So one of the things we see here, pardon me, time for a sip of decaf coffee. The size of the brush depends on the tra scale transform of the underlying shape. So since we tied our hexagons and we were scaling them down, so this little red one is a very small scale value. And our um, renderers, the draw with renderer method before and after pushes the matrix stacks and therefore the scale takes effect. So all of our brush strokes are happening within this matrix scope or matrix transformation of the original shape. If we wanted to change that and have sort of a scale independent brush strokes, we could do that, but then we'd have to modify our pipeline code, which we're not going to do for this lesson. We're going to keep it simple. And if I set the scale of the size of the brushes to be smaller, we're getting something that's a little bit closer to the hexagons. And then we vary the colors a little bit. So the colors are a little bit varied now and we jitter the positions of the brushes a little bit so we get something a little bit more random. And now we're going to increase the density a lot to fill it up, fill up space. So it's getting a little bit slower, it's taking a few seconds to update and that's probably because those two functions I mentioned earlier with the loops and everything like that can be optimized quite a bit but I haven't done that. So this is sort of are nested hexagons with very brush strokes and, um, and the final result. My apologies for that interruption. I decided to add another test case to our lesson today. So I just did a little bit of cutting and pasting. So we're going to create our little wobbly cross. Randomize the colors. Give it the points a little bit. And let's make the shapes a little bit bigger. There we go. So let's say this is our base shape now. And we create our painterly renderer. So we can see that basically the grids are being placed inside the shapes, but they're being scaled as well according to like the hexagons before. So we have some larger um, points here, larger brush strokes here and some smaller brush strokes here. But this one's going to be pretty 
Let's leave the size there so we don't get too small. Some color variations. Some jitter. It's taking a few seconds for each update now. Let's turn off the alpha of the uh, outline color. So this is what we have, and then if we set, let's say, let's just set our density higher. This will take a few seconds. CPU is cranking away, and um, it will show up in a second. So one of the things to do later is to basically profile the code and see where it's spending its time. But this is the final result here now with the very high density of brush strokes and giving us this kind of interesting artistic looking image. But yeah, so this is a point at which if I was working on a production system, I'd say, okay, this is now becoming noticeably slow and lagging. And so let's go and find out what it is. And I'm 90% sure it's basically the point and polygon function is not efficient at all. And I would do some research and find some more efficient ways of doing it, whether it's within the language or a different algorithm. All right, so that was our second part of the renderers in Common Lisp and OpenGL. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.